What's going on, everybody? Andrew Thompson here of the Andrew Thompson Interviews YouTube channel. Joining me today is a man that you've seen all over the independent scene. He just finished up a stretch with AIW out in Cleveland. You've seen him in GCW. You've seen him all over the place. The one and only PB Smooth. What's going on, boss, man? How you feeling? It's a great intro, man. I appreciate that. I'm feeling yeah. good at that one. <laughs> Ain't no problem, man. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. Uh, as we li literally just talked about all of it before we started recording, and I just mentioned you just finished up a string of shows for AIW out in Cleveland. Uh, it was like consistently like for like a week and a half. Uh, how does it kind of feel to, you know, to have those shows like to be back to back? I'm pretty sure it's just a, you know, a good feeling to just, you know, kind of sort of be around the same people that you were around and then also be able to, you know, continue to, you know, get, get your reps in and continue to, you know, show what you can do in the ring on a consistent basis. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, AIW is pretty much like a home promotion for me. Uh, that's where I really got my first big break of working big names and uh, people seeing me on the IWTVs, the fight TVs and whatnot. And uh, it was also good to get back in there and tag with Trey Lamar. Uh, 40 Acres is my tag stable. Mm -hmm. And we, had, we hadn't had like a lot of tag matches recently, obviously in front of like live, live crowds and whatnot. So being able to do that in front of the home crowd, show everybody what we've been working on and stuff was dope. Mm -hmm. And then also seeing the returns of uh, Tim Dons, Eddie Kingston, Allison Kay, like it was great. Like AIW is like a family environment and uh, it's just, it's always a party, a good time when we're mm -hmm. there. And uh, like we were talking about before the camera cut on, I like the idea of having uh, matches back, like back to back, just because if there's something that, I learned from the one before and I want to work on, I could do that like the next day. So it's a quick turnaround for me. Yeah, well, we, you know, we continue to talk about like the consistency of like being, you know, on shows like, and, and, and you know, civilly one promotion, but like, is it like, I, I know there have been times like, as, so like one, one of the things that I like really interested to hear from, from independent wrestlers, is like there are stretches where sometimes there may not be those weeks where you're on shows. There may be weeks where there's nothing. There may be one week or two week where there's not anything going on. And it can take a little bit of like, maybe like, I don't want to say like a serious toll on you, but just like a little, uh, little, little, little a small mental toll, like just because you're yeah. so eager to get back. Like, uh, to just talk to me about that and like how they, they, I'm pretty sure everybody has had those moments where it's like, damn, like, I you know there isn't anything going on. And then, you know, all of a sudden some picks up and then, you know, you start to have that consistency again. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I was actually talking to other wrestlers about this, too, because of uh, like the pandemic and whatnot. I feel for me, there's always something you can be working on and there's different ways to do that. So, for example, if. I, I train with AIW, which is about two hours away from where I live right now. And if I have like a week where I don't have any shows, like I'll make sure that I'm getting my reps in at training. Or if I if I have shows, then obviously I may not go that day just because like I'll be busy the weekend. I want to rest my body or whatnot. And then if that's not an option, um, there have been times I've spent days during the week working on promo packages, working on vignettes just putting out projects on Twitter because obviously we don't have the traditional TV product behind us where right. like how WWE can build their guys up week by week just based on like videos and stuff like that. But as independent wrestlers, we can use Twitter as that tool. You know, like there's no reason that at your house you can't uh, do what I did, buy a green screen, <laughs> learn how to work projects and work on promos and whatnot and, and build in character development because that's just as important as the ring stuff. You know, sometimes the moves don't translate as much as other stuff, you know? And with the uprise of people that have great charisma, like like the Effies, like the Danhausens, like like Warhorse, like you need to know how to entertain the crowd and bring them in, you know? Mm -hmm. People aren't watching these Jake Logan Paul fights because they're great <laughs> boxers, because they're not, but they're watching it because like they know how to get under your skin and make you want to see them get beaten, you know what I mean? So. There's always something to be working on. That's something that I feel gets overlooked a lot. Right, right. And like you, you mentioned, you mentioned like uh, some of the Twitter stuff that you were doing. Like one thing that I necessarily remember is the, uh, the the video that you have put out about AC Mac. Like I, I can't I can't remember like specifically what it was, but it was something like real funny that you did. It was like a, a cartoon like falling off a yeah. cliff or something like that. It was hilarious, bro. And I think it was to like build to a match that you guys were having at the. Was that for the um old Ohio wrestling yeah, old Ohio wrestling alliance? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna talk to you about that later, but like I, I think that's something real, real crucial for a lot of independent wrestlers. Like I've said this like consistently, like through the last maybe 10 interviews or so that I've done, like just asking wrestlers, like, did you, have you started seeing like a shift like in the business, like as far as seeing wrestlers, specifically independent wrestlers, start to treat themselves more like a business opposed to just strictly 
the, what I can do in the ring. Like, you know, you see people branching out to Twitch, you see people, you know, getting into other genres to further expose their brand. Like, have you started to see that shift in the business over the past, you know, several years or so? Absolutely. And people that aren't getting on board aren't realizing the bigger picture. So the goal is to be a draw. And to be a draw, you have to be able to attract fans and money and to people that want to come see the show, right? So, like, if you can get casual fans that aren't, like, diehard wrestling fans to get interested in it, that makes you a draw. That's why, like, WWE brings in, like, Bad Bunny. You know what I'm saying? Or, or like, a random celebrity or something like that. Because to, to grow the fan base, you have to get people that aren't traditional wrestling fans. So, like, you have those core fans that will love you because, like, you're a great wrestler and whatnot. But other people just aren't going to care, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have to find different ways to build that brand and business, especially if you're trying to make money. You know, like right. the goal is to to make a living doing what we love. So it's like if you want to make a living doing what you love, you got to make money. And you to do that, you have to be able to branch out. And like I had made a vignette calling myself an everyday draw just because whether I'm at the airport, at the grocery <laughs> store, no matter where I go, just off my size alone and presence, people come up to me and want to know what I do and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that gives me an outlet to get people to want to come to see a wrestling show, you know what I'm saying, like do stuff like that. So it's just, you have to find your niche and what that is in terms of the entertainment aspect of it and treat it just as important as you do the wrestling aspect. And I feel in my first few years, I didn't do that, you know, mm -hmm. and, when the pandemic hit and I couldn't wrestle for a while, that was my only option to like really find out who PB Smooth is and how I want to portray myself and bring it to the ring and get people to come to shows and whatnot. So yeah, like that that aspect is just as important as all the moves and the, the fundamentals. So yeah. Yeah, I can't I can't believe I'm already saying this, but like it's already almost a full month since WrestleMania weekend happened. I, I, I almost like we nearing it maybe like a week from now. I can't believe how quickly time is flying. But like just being around in that environment again, man, of course the pandemic, you know, stripped away everything that was going to happen uh, last year in Tampa. But, you know, you guys got to do it again this year. Like just tell me what was it like? What was it like in that environment? Like, of course, everything wasn't full blown, you know, because, you know, it had to be socially distanced. Everybody had to wear the mask. It wasn't like, you know, what would we usually expect from a WrestleMania weekend and then just a string of independent shows that happened that weekend. But I'm sure it felt good, you know, to see a lot more phases in the crowd, you know, getting to be around some of your fellow colleagues and stuff like that. I know it just had to be, you know, just an overall good vibe. Oh, it was amazing. And, uh, the venue was big enough that distancing wasn't a problem for anybody. So they were allowed to get like a lot more people than normal in there in a situation like this, which was cool. Um, I got to work with John Davis, who's a legend in his own right. You know, I got to learn a lot from him. We got to bang, that was fun. Um, I had fun on Faye Jackson's show. <laughs> <laughs> she actually let me choreograph that whole dance, which was pretty dope. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, because I would do stuff like that in college for free. So, you know, it's just, <laughs> it works out. And, um, me and Lord Crew had a good one at Unsanctioned Pro. You know, um, unfortunately, some guys got injured, like doing like a lot of strings of shows and whatnot. But overall, it was like a good vibe. You know, people were there to enjoy themselves, you know. Um, I can remember times when I would play basketball and like we lose in like the our NCAA tournament or whatever and I, I'd be at the bars drinking, watching like guys on TV, like the final four and whatnot. And I would get upset, like, yeah, like I wanna be that guy. Like I wanna be the one that people are like enjoying themselves watching. And it's kind of cool because of Mania Weekend with us like being wrestlers and people coming to see us, like it's that vibe, that that feeling that I always wanted. So it was a great time, you know, and, and Tampa's a beautiful place. You know, I rented a little Mercedes, just. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I had some fun. Okay, I, I feel you on that. I feel you on that big big time over there with the Mercedes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, like, uh, before we get into like, I, I want to talk about um, for the culture show and the significance of that show overall, like what that meant to a lot of black wrestlers, a lot of black wrestling fans. But like, one thing I did want to ask you, like, did you, have you heard of this rumor that the Cuban club is haunted? Like, what, 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 did, have you heard of that? Yeah, I heard of it like the day that the day of Faye's show when we were like in there, like changing upstairs, like they're like, you know the upstairs is haunted, right? I'm like, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> talking to me about the people that have like died in there and stuff like that. But I mean it didn't really phase me right. just because right. I'm I'm big on like horror movies and like Halloween and like I get adrenaline rushes from stuff like that, mm. but I also don't like buy into it. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, I think, like, I'm still alive and I'm not, like, I wasn't hearing, like, 
<laughs> whispering and shit. Like, oh, <laughs> they were, so. I mean, I don't know. I it guess was, it, was, it was just weird. Yeah, yeah, it was just weird. It was just weird. But yeah, uh, to talking about the Florida Culture Show, man, like I'm pretty sure it was cool seeing so many black wrestling fans in attendance. Like, you know, just having the string of shows that like, uh, the, the, especially the one you guys did back in January for the Fight Forever. Uh, and then I know there was one in Indianapolis in October of 2020. I believe like, it, I, I'm pretty sure that's just like, you know, one of the better things that I like that I enjoy about professional wrestling, especially civilly on the independent scene and seeing so many black wrestlers spotlighted and just goes to show you that these people do deserve to be on these national televised programs, man. You know, it's so many different and so many talented black athletes out there that really don't get the chance to get spotlighted. But now I'm so happy that the Florida Culture Show is out there to spotlight said individuals. And now, you know, people are starting to recognize how many times the black wrestlers out there. Like I, I recently saw, um, I think yesterday, I think, um, I forgot who, who I saw got announced for, uh, for for one of the AEW Dark Elevation show. It got, it got it, my mind rolling right now, but yeah, I'm, I'm like, just tell me about your experience of photo culture, man, being a part of the, all like the last, the last three shows, I believe the last three photo culture shows and just like, you know, your overall experience in the locker room vibes and you know, how everything turned out for you. So the thing is a lot of black wrestlers, in my opinion, based on what I've seen, like we weren't getting booked places because there was, I don't want to use the word quota, but it was like, like wrestling is almost like a casting role. Like you have to fit a certain, like, Mm. for someone like they wanted to show right and for so long it always seemed like the only role for a black wrestler is to be the angry black man especially for me like being like a 6'9 big dude you know what I'm saying so what For the Culture did was it showed everybody that there are different personas we can be different things like we don't all have to fit one specific mold mm. and that's why I loved guys like like Suge and Swerve and uh, and and Rich Swan, because like they would do things differently. They didn't come out like on some hood shit. You know what I'm saying? Like like someone would listen to R and B music and they'd be vibing and like doing what they do. You know what I mean? And when you watch for the culture, like you see different characters on there. You see different personas. You see mm. the that we're all individuals, even though like we're African American. And I feel like in the beginning, independent wrestling did a very poor job of recognizing that we're all different you know what i'm saying yeah so that definitely put a spotlight in that aspect and this last one specifically was great for me because i've never seen that many black fans at a wrestling show especially growing up where after i turned 16 all my friends thought oh wrestling is corny it's fake da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. and they only care about like basketball like loving hip-hop or some shit you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was cool to like be in an environment where i'm seeing people that look like me that are enjoying the same thing that i am so like right. it was really big for me in that aspect one, one thing that you just mentioned that really kind of stuck out was talking about how there are a lot of black wrestlers that have different characters and like how like they, they break out of that stereotypical box that most people try to put them in like you know you got darius lockhart who's doing this thing. And I don't really think that's a character, but like just talking about the okay. premise of, it's, it's not, but like just talking about like the, you know, the premise of professional wrestling, talking about what he's doing. You got Suge, AJ Gray's mix ended up doing the deathmatch stuff. You know, that's a, that, that's that's very different. Like you don't see a lot of black deathmatch wrestlers like re really like that much. So I think that's really cool to see, man. Like it, it's just a variety of different talent out there that can do a lot of different things. And I, I think it's about time that we got so so many black wrestlers like on the uprise and I can, Say we sit all day and mention a bunch of them. Trisha Dora doing her thing right now. Like is yeah, Calvin Tankman. I was going, I was going to mention him real quick. And I, I, I didn't want to put you in the spot, but I, I was going to ask you to uh, like. So you, of course, you had the match with John Davis, and then you had the match with Calvin Tankman back in January. I was going to ask you which one of those for the culture matches is your favorite, and that necessarily, in the sense, had nothing to do with Tankman or John Davis, but more so of the, let's say, the crowd, the environment. Like which one would you say was like holds more? weight with you and again not not anything to do with your opponents but just more so yeah. the environment the build to it the hype to it like which one would you say it's like kind of you know but just, just holds more weight with you um it's tough because for one if we're talking about an overall crowd aspect and atmosphere it's definitely the one right. with john davis because right. there wasn't really anyone at fight forever because it was 24 mm -hmm. hours and like it was obviously like the wrestlers and production team kind of in there mm -hmm. But I feel my match with Calvin Tankman is what propelled me to get the match with John Davis. Mm. Like, like, Cal, like when I wrestled Calvin, like it was an opportunity for me to show like what I could really do out there in terms of not just being like a big strong dude, showing my athleticism, showing how 
I think, showing that I have like somewhat of a ground game. You know what I'm saying? Like, so they kind of go like hand in hand. Like the Tankman match got me prepared for the Davis match, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you know, you just you just mentioned something, and I'm curious to get your take on it. You know, you are, you know, you being six nine. Like, how, how do you feel about this argument that there is a shortage of traditional big men in the sport of professional wrestling in the sense that like some may feel that you know there's too many big men doing more of the athletic moves the high flying and stuff like that or do you think professional wrestling has just evolved to a point where big men don't have to be you know big guys standing in the corner big boot and then you know that's it um i kind of look at it how i do music and what i mean by that is you have people that are outright say this generation of rap is is terrible. It's right. Terrible, right? <laughs> but those mm. same people aren't taking the time to find artists of the caliber that they like. You know what I'm saying? Because like I used to feel that same way, but then I got introduced to YB and Corday and like like uh, you know what I'm saying like different rappers that have like music with a message. So what I'm saying is like there there are big men out there that wrestle like traditional big men. Um, I, I have a very traditional style with, with spice in there that I do different things here and there. And um, <clears throat> it's not like everyone knows who I am. You know what I mean? Like it's, you have to kind of like take the time to, to look and, and find what's out there. Cause like, I think the indies are good. Like we have oh, cool. yeah. a lot of different talents. It just so happens that certain ones get pushed more than others. So nobody sees like the other, the other ones, like, the main event, Duke Davis and Gannon Jones. They've been around for a while. Mm. They're both like six five, six six. Uh Gannon does like athletic stuff. Duke wrestles like a traditional big man. They work together amazingly, but not many people know who they are. You know what I'm saying? So it's like the talent is out there. That's not the question. It's just a matter of people being able to have access to them. So I think that's a good thing that IWTV has. Like they do a good job of getting a lot of shows on there where you can look through the catalog and find people that fit that caliber. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's just, you we just want to work with their, their favorites as opposed to like, there's other guys out there that can do that. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And I, I think somebody like, uh, that has really like risen up, like just su- super came up over the past year, like dating back to early 2020 was Lee Moriarty. Like dude is just like skyrocketed over the past, uh, he's, over the past he's year. For example, because he worked for Rise Wrestling and Lee's been good forever, but nobody got to see him. So it was fortunate enough that he did like the, the AIW showcase thing and got on the show and he ended up getting those matches with Alex, Alex Shelley. Yep. But mm-hmm. there are guys out there that are hidden gems. Like uh, nobody knows Tony Johnson, but he's just as good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there's guys out there that people just aren't realizing and another thing to to touch on the big man aspect I feel that when we saw a guy like Keith Lee come out that Mm. was ultra athletic elite athlete but big as hell like Mm. people got afraid and felt they had to fit that mold to get a job Mm. and like I feel like for me that was something like I was kind of confused about because I had too many like voices in my head telling me, oh, you need to wrestle this way, you need to wrestle that way or whatever. But then everything like contradicted itself when Keith Lee, Keith Lee blew up mm-hmm. and, and Dijak blew up. So it's a matter of figuring out what works best for you and doing that and not giving a damn what this person, that person, that person got to say and just follow the wave with it. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah, there, there are like a lot of like different super heavy ways that are out there in professional wrestling. Like, you know, you mentioned Keith Lee, you got uh, Jacob Fatu, who, yeah. who is like hella crazy, man, the ring. Jacob Fatu is crazy. Like I mentioned, Calvin Tankman. Like, but uh, ca- kind of going back to, you know, the WrestleMania weekend festivities, uh, you did talk about the uh, Faye Jackson, uh, Grace Webb Clans, uh, Battle Royal. Uh, of course, Faye Jackson, you know, uh, m- m- much blessings to her. She uh, she announced her retirement recently from professional wrestling. I'm pretty sure a lot of people are hoping for an eventual uh, return one day. But but I, I, think, I think one of the cooler things coming out of that show was when uh, JTG uh, won the Battle Royal and then he got the honor uh, Shad Gaspar with the, um, you, you know, with the Hall of Fame award that, that, that Faye Jackson presented and, you know, all of you guys presented, like, how, how cool was a moment, you know, for that, for to, to see that happen for JTG? I'm pretty sure, you know, it hasn't been easy for him at all. You know, we all fight our, you know, own individual battles that we don't share publicly, but I'm pretty sure it hasn't been something easy to deal with losing, you know, his closest friend. And then, you know, to have that moment and get, you know, to get, get that get that special moment right there in the middle of the ring and have people, you know, celebrate and you guys celebrate. I'm pretty sure that was just like, yeah, like, like right on. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, me and him, like, I'm not that close with him because I like I I kind of had conversations with him in passing or like being on shows with him. But when when you've been around somebody for that long and then something like that happens, it's it's devastating. I already know, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So I just try to keep like good vibes and good energy whenever I see him. Mm-hmm. It's crazy because that was our original original for the culture match. It was Forty Acres versus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then everything happened or whatever. And uh, it just sucks because I feel people like we all know like they don't really get their flowers until they die. Essentially, that's that's but, that's that's sad, bro. Like it, it's true what you're saying, but like it's it's like it, you know it is. And there's so much that I've learned about Chad since his death that like he's become like a role model for me. Mm. You know what I'm saying like the way he's he's carried himself, the things he's done in his community, like. Uh, how he stopped the dude from almost robbing like a gas station. Like, like there's just so much about that guy that was like not mainstream that I feel should have been. Like he right. should have been a lot more love than he did. But at the end of the day, like there's only so much we can do at this point. So having that like that moment for him at the Great Sweatpants show was like, it was great. And I feel that it did what it needed to do. Yeah, I, you know, something you just brought up, like I feel like that's like one of the I don't want to say worse, but like one of the, like, I'm going to just use the term because I can't think of anything else right now. Like one of the worst slash best things, like, when, like it, it's, it's kind of sad how, you know, it takes someone to pass away for everybody to like collectively, you know, give them their flowers opposed to when they're still here. But I think it's also a thing of like, we are kind of not, 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 not non-appreciative, but like just knowing that we have them here and that we can, uh, I guess, like eventually one day do that. And so you don't like come to mind, like, oh, let me do this now. And then when you lose them, it's like, you know, it, it, it's always like one of those it, weird it's things, man. Weird yeah. you never, I mean, cause when someone dies, it's it's almost like the closing of their book. So now you have the full book to look at and read. That's a, that's a good point. So, so like, mm-hmm. I get it. It's just, it's tough because there's so many people that go through life feeling like, they're unappreciated and unloved and whatnot. And then you wonder like if they ever got that love, how much more they could have done with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. I don't know, it's, it's, it's one of those life questions you don't really know the answer to, you know? Yeah, that, that was a good point you brought up, but kind of transitioning more to a, a more positive note. Like one, yeah, of my yeah. favorite, one, one, one of my favorite matches of yours that you had this year was of course the match we talked about uh, earlier with AC Mack at the OWA show. I think that was the same show that had uh, the great match between uh, Gresham and John, uh, John Gresham and Myron Reed uh, that closed that show. Like, what, what, was that one of your, uh, probably one of your favorites of this year? I feel like you and AC Mack, you guys just kind of like, I, I don't know. It just seemed like you guys just kind of really clicked with each other. Like it seemed like you yeah. guys had like real solid chemistry in the ring. Does that kind of come from, you know, you guys probably, you know, just having good rapport, you know, outside of the ring and then, you know, it just transitions or do you guys just, you know, naturally just click in the ring? Believe it or not, like we maybe have had like two or three conversations <laughs> before there, but that's easily one of my top three fader matches. And like the, the, so Justin, the, the promoter at OWA, he he's good at challenging me when he when he brings bookings or whatever. So his whole thing was let me bring in a guy that I think does better promos than PB Smooth, mm. and then let's see where this goes because he knows like I'm going to try to rise to the occasion. So like like AC Max like literally like one of like the top guys in the South. You know what I'm mm. saying? And I love guys that can go in the ring and get the other aspect of being entertaining and whatnot. So like, I, t- I just took it as a challenge and I'm like, you know, like there's a great story that can be told here. You know what I'm saying? Cause like, like I said, he knows how to go in the ring and he's smart and he knows how to like get people engaged. You know, like he, he makes a job easy for like, like a baby face cause he's that good of a heel. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have many guys that can just stay on that switch. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like him, like uh, Charles Mason, like, like there's a few of them, but it's not like a, a wide thing. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So like when we were in the ring together, it was just like natural chemistry. Like like stuff like that doesn't happen often. Right. But it made it easier for me to present PB Smooth in the light that I wanted people to see in that. Like well, one of the things that I've like seen from AC Mack, like is that he's like, we talking about his promo stuff. He's like really good at 
not down talking his opponent, but down talking his opponent in a way, like in the sense, I'm pretty sure you've heard this countless times. So like when you're about to face somebody, you don't ever want to get to the point like where you start making them appear as a weak opponent. Cause then if you beat them, it's just like, you know, okay, you just beat somebody weak. But if you like kind of build them up while still simultaneously turning them down, it's like, you know, it, it, work, it works out for everybody. Yeah, people don't understand that aspect. So if I ever have to wrestle someone and they do that, I'm already like, turned off. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that, but it's it's honestly the truth. Mm. But, but that's what makes for a compelling match and a compelling story. Like we're out there trying to entertain people. And like, that's, you know, like that's the best way to do it. Let's say people, I was gonna ask you like, do you wish like there was a promotion where it was like more so of a weekly consistent thing like it doesn't necessarily have to be on tv it could just be like a youtube series to where you guys can have time to like build like a consistent story or like won't have to wait another month to continue and then like having the possibility of people forgetting what happened in the past matt do you wish there was kind of something along those lines to where you guys could just have something consistent like and you can it can be weekly and it can, it can progress and you guys can go in and out of storylines on a consistent basis. Like, do you, would you, do you wish that was something that was like out there at the moment right now for, for independent wrestlers? Yeah, I mean, that'd be cool. I feel like um, IWA Mid-South would do something like that. Mm -hmm. I know they used to run weekly and I believe OVW runs weekly. I'm not completely oh, sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, like, I mean, there's a few, but overall that is something that could like shift the balance, I think. And I mean that, especially like for guys that are starting out and need more access to like TV time and stuff like that. Mm. I think that would be beneficial. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't see, I don't see anything going wrong with that. It might, it might be hard to draw money like in terms of like yeah. at the gate and stuff sometimes, but I think it'd be cool. All right, and we got to talk about the uh, the forty acres tag team with yourself and uh, Trey Lamar, and uh, we can't, can't forget about honorary member AJ Gray. Got got, got to include him in the, uh, in, in the mix, man. But how, how how good is it for you to like see? I'm proud of you, a Trey Lamar, man. I'm pretty sure he's proud of you as well. But just seeing it from your perspective, like you know, seeing him do his thing, you know, you doing your thing as well, and then you guys get to collectively come together at times. I'm pretty sure it's cool to seeing somebody that you work with closely, you know, going and take off, and then you you being able to take off at the same time. I'm pretty sure it's just a a, a mutual good feeling between you two. Yeah, so um, we started training, like, like he started training like a few months after me. Mm. So like, he's always been around, you know, like we, we grew like a bond and a friendship throughout the years. And uh, I've seen him grow as an adult. You know what I'm mm. saying? I've seen him like takes his, takes his lumps and bruises, just like I've taken mine. So we naturally just have like organic chemistry just from like our friendship. Mm. So that makes it easier to translate into the ring. And we also have now have Jocelyn Navarro part of 40 Acres. So now, now we can do cool stuff with her. And like, she just had a singles with Allison Kay and she killed it. So mm. uh, I, I feel like the sky's the limit for us, man. Mm. You know, like we bring a different dynamic to independent wrestling right now. Just like, uh, and we're not even like a big guy, little guy, like tag team. Cause Trey's actually pretty tall and strong and athletic. So mm. it's like, we can do cool stuff. Like uh, I highly, suggest watching our last match with the main event at AIW. Uh, that was a that was a great one. And you'll see how like we've come together and like we kind of can read off each other and whatnot. So yeah that's cool. And shout out to uh main events who I know they just got a uh they got a couple spots on on AEW Dark or AEW Dark Elevation. It was one of those. So yeah shout out to them. Um like one, one, uh, so you you came out of the AIW wrestling academy, right? Yes, so, trained so you, under Johnny Gargano. Yeah, trained under Johnny Gargano. Like, what, what, what was it like? Um, you know, of course, the yeah, obvious like, what was it like training with Johnny Gargano? I think, uh, what were you a part of the same like class as uh, Dominic Garini, or was Dominic Garini training uh, at the time? Yeah, um, I, I'm kind of part of that class, but Dom was there before I was. Okay. There's a few of them that were there before me. So Johnny and Candice would run the classes, mm. and they were good at getting people out of their shells. Like they had me doing like Lucha stuff <laughs> to me like different roles and whatnot. And they were kind of like giving me the tools to figure out what I want to do. Right. You know what I'm saying? So like before that I was training at a school called, uh, it was like pro wrestling rampage in Erie, Pennsylvania, where I currently live right now. And the problem was we only had one day of ring time per month when we had shows. Ooh. So we'd go up to the, the venue at 8 a.m., set up the ring, train, shower, come back, and, like, do the show or whatever. 
and then we wouldn't be able to get back into the ring for like another month just because we didn't have like a, a storage unit or a place to put the ring to like train and whatnot. So AIW brought me some stability when it came to training. So I was going back and forth to Cleveland twice a week for close to like two years, maybe. Mm. And then like I eventually like started like debuting for them and whatnot. So it kind of worked out better, you know? Mm. I gotta ask you. So uh, I've heard from from like several people that have come out of the AIW wrestling school that have been a part of AIW. They they always say that Candice LeRae is the more stern and strict one opposed to a Gargano's like kind of like the laid back, like you know, just just very helpful. Like hey, you know, it's okay, you know, you did this. But they say Candice like C- C- Candice could be a little, you know, she 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 she, she could be a little stern, man. Oh, Candice doesn't play. It, it's so funny because <laughs> like. If Johnny watches a match, he'll be like, good, good. Um, I would have done this, this, and this. And I'm like, damn, like, all right, I could have worked on that. Because coming from, like, a college uh, sports background, I'm used to coaches being in my face or whatever. So I can take con- constructive criticism. It doesn't right. bother me. But Johnny's just such a nice dude that he'll <laughs> tell you, but he, he'll never, like, be up on you about it. He, he won't criticize you. Like, at yeah. all. Like it, 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 it'll probably be, like, subtle, but it, it won't be, like, anything, like, you know, in your face. Yeah, yeah, but, and Candace will cheer you on, too, but if something right. looks like shit, she'll tell you that, too. But I'm, <laughs> but I'm okay with that. Like, it's it's the perfect balance, you know? Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, as you continue to progress and as you continue to establish your name, like, could you see yourself or would you want to, you know, make an appearance on an AEW Dark or, you know, have an eventual uh, WWE trial or appear on Impact Television. I think Impact is like one of the better programmers out there right now over the past year. They've done really well over the pandemic because you see yourself in, in, you know, either of those places. And I, I know like uh, yeah, I know you guys don't really like specifically independent wrestlers. Like when they get asked these questions of like, where would you want to go? I know it's just like, like, I don't like, you know, but like if you had to like more so decide on a spot that will fit PB smooth and will allow you to express yourself in a way that you feel you could properly express yourself to get yourself out to, to the masses. Like what, 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 would, what would you kind of say like is a, a potential landing spot, just a place that would just let you be you? Um, it, it's tough because, you know, like when I first came in the game, my whole eyes was just set strictly on WWE. Mm-hmm. But I mean, as the growth of professional wrestling like progresses and whatnot, I'm learning about like these new TV companies. Like I didn't know about Ring of Honor. I didn't know mm-hmm. about Impact and whatnot. And that's because I was a casual wrestling fan. I wasn't like a core, like independent guy before I started. Mm-hmm. So it's more of a situation where I want to wrestle full time for a TV company, but my goal is to make them want me. So then I have a choice as opposed to, I specifically want to go to this place. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Cause I feel th- I'm not like putting myself in like a box that I'll be like, like crushed if like this doesn't happen. You know what I mean? Like my main goal right now is just to focus on getting better, being in the moment and building my brand like organically. Mm-hmm. So that when that time comes, I'll, I'll be able to make a good decision in terms of what what choice I want to make with PB Smooth going forward. You know, something cool that you just said is like, uh, you know, you being in the moment, like I think a lot of people kind of, we like we as humans, a lot of people like we just as humans, we get so focused on like, what's next, what's next, what's next, like even me, like, I feel like I'm doing something that I've always wanted to do. I've been, you know, interviewed a bunch of wrestlers, interviewed some, you know, some top names. And like, sometimes I'm always thinking about, okay, like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And I'm kind of forgetting, like, dude, like you doing what you wanted to do like you know you know what i'm saying i'm pretty sure it's the same thing for you like is at times you probably like well you know i wish i could i wish i could do this let's do this let's move to the next thing and then at times you kind of like you're literally doing what you've always wanted to do it's like but but it's hard at the same time to focus because you so like what's going what's happening next what's next on the bucket list well it's that and it's outside factors of like someone always saying when are you going to be on tv or when are you going to do this when are you going to do that i'm like I'm traveling right now. I'm getting paid to wrestle. People are like buying my my merch and like I'm signing autographs and whatnot. Let me focus on being the best I can be. So you're being flown right. out to wrestle. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> the time comes like that's gonna happen when it's supposed to. Like I'm 29 years old mm-hmm. and I'm just now finding out that guys that are getting signed and hitting their peaks and whatnot, like a majority of them don't do that until their mid or late 30s. Yeah. So it's like my my biggest fear was I was getting too old, but I'm actually not. Mm. And my body is like it, it feels better than when I was younger because I'm taking care of myself better now. Like I'm mm. 
I'm training properly to fit the sport I'm doing. I'm uh, keeping a healthy vegan diet. You know what I'm saying? So like, I'm going to be around for a while. Like I've been mm -hmm. feeling good and confident that when the time comes for me to be somewhere, it's going to happen. <laughs> All right. Favorite cheat meal? Uh, that's a tough one. But I'll probably <laughs> go with Chinese. Like okay. I've been rocking uh, sesame tofu lately. Okay. It's really good. Mm -hmm. um, I do love pizza. <laughs> before before I did more vegan stuff, I would really like chicken parm. Mm -hmm. And it's also because I live in Pennsylvania now. When I lived in New York, like the, the, the food was amazing. Like the pizza was good, like all that kind of stuff. It don't taste the same out here. Mm. But uh, I'm going to visit my family at the end of May in New York. So I feel, like, I feel like I'm probably going to go nuts a little bit. Yeah, you can get down when you, go, when you go back home. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I wanted to ask you, like, when was um, – that match that you had with Eddie Kingston in, in, in AIW. Like I, I remember like last night when I was, you know, doing some prep for the interview, I went and watched that. That was a, that was a nice little like eight minute, nine minute sprint that y'all had, man. It was just like, you know, you guys are just taking it to each other, all, all strikes hitting the hell out of each other, the whole match. Like I, I, I felt like that was like, you know, probably that, that seemed like it was like early on in your career, I'm assuming. And it just like, that was, yeah. That was probably like my third or fourth match for okay. AIW. What, what, what that, a fourth match right there, Eddie Kings. That, that's what I'm saying. Like, that first year, like, Thorne threw me in the fire. And, mm. like, I'm glad he did that. Because when I was working, like, in Erie, I'm used to being, like, the biggest dude around to the point that I can almost, like, wrestle like the big show. But mm. I don't look like the big show. I don't move like the big show. I don't weigh 400 pounds. You know what I'm saying? So, like, him putting me in there with different types of guys that are veterans and whatnot that have been around the block, it, it started helping me mold how I wanted to be a wrestler. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm forever like grateful for that. Mm -hmm. do, do you feel like just over the years, like was one thing I noticed in that match, like it seemed like, like from the beginning, you were kind of like, not, now I want to call it say hesitant, but like at the beginning, you were kind of like just, you know, letting it come. And then like over, like as the match went on, you started to get more aggressive. And then like, you started to hit Eddie, how he was hitting you. And it was like, okay, here we go. Like he's starting to starting to feel it a little bit. Like, have you seen like your style of wrestling sort of evolve over the past few years? Like when you started to notice yourself get more aggressive and get more comfortable with like, you know what, when I get in here, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have to hit you and you know, it's gonna be what it is, not hurt anybody, but you know, just, yeah. just, just starting to get more aggressive in the ring. Well, yeah, like that's something I've definitely struggled with. Cause you know, like, and, and this is something that should D help me with when I recently worked him. And that's why my matches have changed drastically. When, when I was growing up as a kid, I was always bigger than everybody. So you always say, hey, be careful. Don't do this, don't do that. Don't hurt anybody, you know what I'm saying? Right. So it's like, because of that, me not knowing my own strength, I try to like be careful and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to guys smaller than me, they be laying it into me trying to look <laughs> bad. So it's like at that point, like you know what I mean? Like fuck it, like you gotta right. do this. We're gonna do this. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so like that's something that I've had conversations with like AJ about. Me and John Davis talked about that, and and Shug, and like after that, it's like whatever. Like I don't care anymore. Like. Like, I'm going to be a big man. You're going to respect me and my size and whatnot. So if you, if you get rocked a few times, then it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, okay, so lastly, like, I, I just want to throw this out there. Like, probably one of my one, one of my matches from the independent scene that I really want to see. And, and, you know, just from talking to you since you're here, like, I was like, I was thinking, like, you and Freya Yeha would probably be, like, a real, like, real, like, just, just, just a technical, like, class. I feel like you guys' styles would like really mesh well together. I don't know, that just kind of came to my mouth. I was like, I, I would be interested in seeing, uh, you know, seeing you versus Fred. So yeah, I just want to throw that out there, man. And uh, of course, I do want to thank you for your time. I appreciate you, you know, doing, uh, taking the time out your day to do this with me. Please feel free to plug, you know, your Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, merchandise, anything you got. I'm gonna make sure I plug it in the description of this video. Yeah, the easiest way to, to get caught up with me at this point is just to go to prettyboysmove.com. Okay. I have all my links on there from different merch sites to all my social media handles my man right there, there, there. Like, everything that you need is on there so it's like a one-stop shop and mm -hmm. that makes it easy so prettyboysmove.com there you go there you have it ladies and gentlemen everybody i'm andrew thompson of the andrew thompson interviews youtube channel i'm signing off with the man himself pb smooth and we are out peace yes, sir.